pandemic because pharmacies are, are filling these gaps. And I do believe we, we need to have some more of this research. So uh, to put it into perspective, why do we need um, health economic evaluation? Well, resources are scarce. And the, when the decision comes to reimburse uh, technology, whether it's a medicine, a device, or a healthcare intervention provided by pharmacies, we need to prove two things. We need to prove um, incremental effectiveness of our service versus in, for instance, the usual care, and we need to um, be able to demonstrate health gains at a reasonable cost for the health system. So, so it, it makes it easier to reimburse that technology, that service, and because that implies a choice. Now, uh, the other message I also would like uh, to, um, to, to give here, because I found in a lot of studies, um, we do not um, define our population intervention comparator and outcomes uh, very well. This is particularly um, troublesome for, for some pharmacy research studies. So I think we, we have to, um, to clearly be able to, um, to define uh, the population, the intervention, the comparator, and the outcome. What I mean by this is not necessary to say that we are providing a hypertension management service. What is the population, the target population? Um, is it a niche? Is it uncontrolled uh, uh, hypertensive patients? Or is it controlled and uncontrolled? Is it above um, 65 years old, or um, do we have people from, you know, spanning from 50 years old to 80 years old? All this is very important to, to define because um, it impacts the definition, the very definition of the technology. Um, so when sometimes we see research studies on um, medication review, Medication review might be something in one country and might be something very different in another country, which is why it's important to define. Uh, again, the intervention is also important to be defined. And uh, very often our interventions in pharmacies are complex interventions. It means they have several uh, components. We can do a follow-up of, of patients. We can measure blood pressure. Um, we can send um, reminders uh, to when, when the, the medication, the package is, is, uh, uh, is, is approaching um, its, its end. So um, there are several components uh, in an intervention and all these need to be defined. Uh, the other thing is the frequency. How often do we see the patient? Do we see the patient once a week, once a month? Um, how long do we see the patient in the pharmacy? So these are all the components that need to be defined in the intervention. The comparator and, of course, the outcomes are also very important. In economic evaluation, we also need to define which perspective are we evaluating. Is it the healthcare payer or is it a societal perspective? Because there are differences. The societal perspective, for instance, will include productivity costs and direct costs, but not the health care care payer um, perspective. And uh, so we will see some of those. And the time horizon needs to be for how long, if we are going to run a trial, for how long do we run a trial? We need to run a, for, uh, uh, for a time duration, which is long enough to be able to capture all effects and all relevant costs. So in the concept um, and, the, and the economic evaluation, there are two things that are very important, inputs and outputs. In other words, the costs and the consequences. And uh, this is the first. And the second one, it always means a choice between two or, two or more alternatives. So we always have to compare our intervention versus something. Uh, even if it's the absence of the intervention, even if it's the usual care or some other intervention. 
and we need to perform four tasks. We need to identify, to measure, to value uh, both costs and consequences of, of two or more services, let's call it this way. And then we need to compare. Uh, so then uh, we have, um, uh, 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 let's say, a summary measure um, for the economic evaluation. So this is very simplistic. I, I don't have time to go into details, but um, there are many types of studies. Some, they just look at the, they describe the outcomes. Some, they describe costs. Some describe both. But um, but uh, they they don't compare alternatives. When they do compare alternatives, they can compare maybe just the outcomes, and then we have effectiveness studies, or just the costs, and then we have cost analysis studies. But when they compare both um, effects and costs, we then have a full economic evaluation. And the most important types of analysis are described here, cost effectiveness, cost utility, cost analysis. I won't speak about cost minimization because it's not so relevant for services, it's more relevant maybe for, in the case of generics, for instance, where the effect is the same. So we just um, compare um, costs and we assume the effect is the same. So uh, the difference between the three major full economic evaluation types is, of course, on the consequences, what we call the consequences. And uh, the, the costs are all measured. I, I, I Here I, I stated euro, but it could be US dollars or, or the, the country currency. Um, and then, of course, we have um, the, the, on the cost effectiveness, the consequences are your natural outcomes of the disease. So it could be things like life years gain, survival, um, uh, adverse clinical events averted, for instance, myocardial infarction that were averted, improved blood pressure and cholesterol values, um, improved patient reported outcomes and things like that. For cost utility, we will use quality. Um, so, um, and, 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 and for um, quality adjusted life years and, and for cost benefit consequences are measured also in currency um, uh, using um, uh, certain methods. Now, I want to say that the first two, the cost effectiveness and cost utility are non-welfare approaches uh, and the, the cost benefit is a welfare approach. A welfare approach means that um, it leaves up to the individual, it considers the individual to be the best judge for um, his valuing um, his health. Uh, and this is not used uh, in, in, for, for valuing medicines, for instance, but it's very useful when it comes to services because services, unlike uh, medicines, do not have a market price. So if they do not have a market price and there are other benefits that are not necessarily health benefits, um, but they are valued by patients, um, it's also important to capture those benefits. So usually um, we find them a lot also in services, complementing um, the other two approaches, which are often mandatory for reimbursement uh, purposes. Now, um, this is an, it's not an extensive list, but it's uh, just a, a list of examples on possible costs. So remember I said that uh, in economic evaluations, we always have to identify, measure, value, and then compare costs and consequences. So uh, first of all, we identify the cost. And, and uh, this can be different from uh, depending on the research study. But in pharmacies, uh, we would normally encounter, you know, the medication use, the procedures, the exam, um, point of care whenever they're performed in pharmacies, appointments. And please notice that here, this is applying not just for pharmacy, but also, so you're, it has to be the cost captured in both intervention and usual care. So if your intervention involves like uh, medical appointments and healthcare resources, you would have costs for medical appointments, but also for pharmacy appointments. 
Okay, you would have point of care, which was performed in the pharmacy, but also at the doctor. Um, you would have exams prescribed um, at the primary care or, and at the hospital level. So, so these are all, you have to consider both intervention and, and um, comparator and, and, and your control, let's say. Then you have um, the use of healthcare resources, such as the emergency room visits, and hospital admission. And hospital admission, you would measure the number of days or so the length of stay. Uh, and those are all, um, let's say, direct costs. And here we have also um, like direct costs, uh, uh, but, but um, it, not medical related. So they're patient related. So the patient cost of transport, for instance, whenever he has a medical appointment or when he uses the healthcare resources. And then of course we have the uh, indirect costs, uh, productivity costs, which has to do with the patient travel time and time spent in, in the appointment um, and patient days of work loss. So this measures productivity and is not considered when the perspective is healthcare, um, is of the healthcare paid, but it has to be considered when it's a societal perspective. So basically what you would do, you would collect the resources. So the quantity that was used um, for the duration of your trial, then you assign unit costs and you basically multiply um, to have a resource use times unit cost. You might have to do adjustments. If your prices are, let's say from five, six years ago, you will have to adjust them to the current date, so the current year, and you would use the most, uh, normally you would use the consumer price index uh, or uh, any other rules uh, established in your country. Uh, if, if, the, if your trial is, um, lasts for more than one year, um, then you would have, you know, uh, you would collect um, costs and, and, and outcomes in the second, third year, and, and so on. So you would have to apply the discount rate to, um, to have present value um, because all costs and benefits have to be uh, discounted um, if, if, if the trial lasts um, longer. So um, then you have the measurement of effectiveness. If you're conducting a cost effectiveness, these are some of the examples of, of effectiveness um, outcomes that would be collected in the pharmacy. So it always changes, okay? So it's either improving values, changing, improving adherence, uh, improving the proportion of control patients. Um, could be some diseases like uh, acute diseases, could be time to symptom free or improved patient reported outcomes. Uh, and again, you would measure these outcomes, you apply the discount rate and you estimate the effectiveness. For um, quality of life, for, for let's say cost utility, um, there are some steps you would have to perform. You would have to uh, collect quality of life. Um, and there are several instruments, the most accepted in, in Europe uh, for in for reimbursement purposes, the EQ 5D um, 3L, but there are countries uh, that already have the 5L. Um, so you would measure this, and then you would need to estimate the utility because there is the score that you collect um, from the patients. They they can evaluate usually at the at the baseline, and then for instance um, at several time point measurements. And then you estimate the utilities. And for that, you need to use the value set of your own country. If you do not have uh, the value set for your country, you would use uh, the value set of a country um, that is closest to you in terms of, of epidemiology and culture, um, uh, behaviors, etc. cetera. And, and then you estimate, you calculate the quality using the area under the curve method. So you don't use the classical epidemiology here. Um, you would use the area under the curve, um, which is um, detailed by, by the health economy. So we don't have time to go. 
But you can see here this graph, this is from Michael German. You can see, for instance, here is when you estimate utility. So after you, you, you have a, you're already on step two. So the highest utility you can have is one. This is the perfect health. Zero, it means dead. So everyone usually uh, for the duration will progress um, and basically uh, can improve or can, um, can decrease. This can happen if you don't have an intervention. So it means your health status will um, decrease over time. But if you do have an intervention, be it a medicine or a healthcare intervention, it, it may be less, um, it may be, it may take longer, as you can see. Um, and, and, um, and, and so it will take longer uh, to reach, um, uh, for this person to die. So the, 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 the gap between the two is in fact the incremental uh, quality uh, adjusted life. So um, the third one we spoke about is the stated preference. Okay, the, the, the cost benefit. You remember I told you um, for cost benefit analysis, how do we measure then? How do we capture the benefit in terms of euro or in terms of US dollars? Usually we would use um, contingent valuation techniques. Um, there are, I, I listed on the left side, um, the three most frequent accepted contingent valuation and, and, but actually, uh, nowadays, uh, the most, um, used one is the three choice. And all of these, um, are, uh, aimed at estimating the willingness to pay or willingness to accept, depending on the, on, on, on what we want to, to estimate, but it's like the euro that the, and remember it's a welfare approach. So if the individual, he's, he's judging what is um, in fact uh, his willingness to pay for, um, for keeping that uh, new healthcare intervention or new health care service. And, and this is done not by, a direct willingness to pay nowadays, but uh, through choices that patients um, are requested. So uh, the purpose is to reach a summary measure. So a summary measure has to do with, could be an incremental cost effectiveness ratio. Um, when you compare the cost of, of both the intervention, let's say usual care, and again, the effectiveness, so the difference uh, in effectiveness. And you then um, reach a value. Uh, this is useful when you want to compare two, um, two interventions that are alike. So you can compare, for instance, medication review with medication review, but you cannot compare, you cannot compare the value of a medication review with, um, let's say, a hypertension management service. So you cannot compare different technologies uh, in here, but it's very useful and it's very used um, in, 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 our, in pharmacy services more than in, in medicine, um, in the economic evaluation of medicines. We use this because we do measure and um, we do have a lot of natural outcomes that are uh, important um, to, to kind of um, uh, ascertain the, the, the value. The other reason is there are some diseases and, and especially in the community pharmacy, uh, we work a lot with chronic diseases. So chronic diseases are not very sensitive to quality of life changes um, and the, or at least generic quality of life. So um, it's very important to perform cost effectiveness um, if you're doing cost utility in, in chronic disease, because in some cases, it's very difficult to see changes in quality of life, and so in cost utility. Um, so this is, is something you would use. Cost utility, as I mentioned before, um, it's basically the same uh, equation. So the incremental cost utility ratio, and some papers also call it incremental cost effectiveness ratio. They use the same terminology, <coughs> but you would see quality uh, instead of effectiveness. 
and and these are the this is the number one use um, in the world of medicine so um healthcare payers for reimbursing uh medicine they would request most likely um they would prefer this approach uh because the quality uh, they they report on both the effectiveness so the quality of life perceived by the patient but also on the on the survival let's say on the duration uh, of lifespan so they incorporate uh, a bit of both um, and and this is preferred for the medicines. But again, for the pharmacy services, we have sometimes some difficulties in using this um, uh, this this, uh, this this summary measure and this approach for um, chronic diseases. I I I think it's it's important to use both when you're working with uh, chronic diseases. So um, then. Uh, uh, after having the ICERs, let's say the summary measures, you would normally perform um, what we say bootstrap. Bootstrap it means that you you would have to um, estimate your level, your degree of uncertainty, because when you reach an average value of, the, of your ICER, let's say this value, you need to 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 understand what is the, the level of uncertainty around this, and for this reason, you would perform normally bootstrap uh, bootstrap ICERs, um, and you would then plot the bootstraps onto a cost-effectiveness plane. So each of these dots is actually a nicer, uh, and and what this with what this cloud represents here is it gives you um, a sense of uh, how likely is your new intervention going to be cost effective? Uh, so in here you have cost, increased cost and increased effectiveness. Okay, incremental cost here is incremental effectiveness, be it qualities or something else. So whenever it's on this quadrant, it means that your intervention has higher costs, but it also has higher, let's say, benefits, higher effectiveness or higher uh, quality. So you would you want to have your uh, dot of uh, uh, your your cloud of dots you want preferably here or even better here. Uh, this is very unlikely that in, in medicine you have a new intervention that will be less costly and more effective. It almost never happens, but it does happen in pharmacy services. You do have a lot of preventive services that somehow when are compared to the usual care, or even if when they are compared to a drug, uh, they are in fact uh, less costly and more benefit. So you would find them here uh, in this fourth quadrant. Um, then um, after uh, the cost effectiveness plane, you would then have uh, to see the probability of being cost effective, or cost effective at, at different thresholds of willingness to pay. So this is your um, cost effectiveness acceptability curve um, where you can see that, and it's, this is very easy to interpret because um, if your health payer has more money willing to pay for this, um, for this new intervention, usually you would find, of course, the probability of being cost effective, then, then it increases. Um, so, um, so it, this is important to see, um, for instance, at the threshold, when it's about quality, the threshold is 20,000 um, euro, for instance, um, uh, how, uh, how probable, what is the probability of being cost effective? Because this could be the curve like this, or it could be here. And if it's here, it's not good. It means the probability of being cost effective at the threshold of 20,000 euro uh, would be very low. And so um, it's not worth uh, funding or reimbursing the, the technology. So um, now on to very quickly to a cost benefit analysis. As I told you, this is uh, different from the others, very different. It's a welfare approach. The others are non-welfare approaches. Um, and this one, the net 
we the summary measure we use is not a ratio. Um, although some papers do have ratios, but um, uh, most health economists do not recommend ratios um, because of double um, counting in terms of, of, of uh, the willingness to pay. So here, what we often find is net benefit. Uh, putting it very simple, this is your willingness to pay, okay, that you have estimated previously. Um, so, so the willingness to pay for your technology, for your new services, minus the willingness to pay for your old service or your usual care. And then, of course, you compare the cost. Uh, and so the difference is, um, if it's positive, it's because your, the benefits or, let's say, the, 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 the value that has been um, uh, perceived by patients exceeds the cost, the, the real cost incurred, and which is good. Whenever you have a positive value here, it means that patients perceive a higher benefit than the actual cost incurred. So um, it, it's important to have a positive net benefit and the higher the value, uh, the better. Um, sometimes um, we do not use uh, I don't have time to go into details, but sometimes we do not compare um, with the usual tier because if we use like the discrete choice, um, uh, let's say if we use the willingness to pay, some authors would argue that you do not um, you do not elicit the preferences through willingness to pay to people who have not experienced the service, okay? Because they would not know what to, um, how to value something that hey, they have not experienced. So, um, so, so some authors argue that uh, sometimes you just uh, do this for your intervention arm because, and then you elicit the preferences for willingness to pay or willingness to accept depending on what you are looking at. Um, and then you incorporate um, this into uh, when you then, other than the willingness to pay, when you, when you then subtract the cost, you, you are actually performing your cost benefit analysis, okay? So then you would have the net benefit. And I told you about the limitations, but, um, it, but this is a very useful technique um, that we should use more in pharmacy services because our services are, do not have market prices. So I think it's very useful because we are able to capture other dimensions, uh, non-health dimensions that are actually valued by patients. And, and that is important to in, in when requesting reimbursement. Uh, so now moving on to the health economic approaches in pharmacy practice. Okay, I've shared some of the foundations. Now I want to share um, some of the specifics on health economic um, applied to pharmacy practice research, because there are certain things which are a bit different from the health economic evaluation used for, you know, the economic evaluation of, of medicine for reimbursement. And, and, and I found this, and, and, um, and, and I also would like to share this because it could be useful also for future research. Um, so the thing here is, um, as you can see, um, basically the steps number one, two, and three are, let's say, similar to what occurs in the world of medicine. So if, if, you, if you're familiar with the value dossier of, of medicine industry, usually whenever they prepare a reimbursement um, request, they will have a value dossier. What's the value dossier? The value dossier has usually an extensive systematic review of the already existing evidence about that particular drug um, prior to anything. So, they, they already have, it. usually their first part is on building the evidence around that particular um, medicine. So uh, we, we do the same. 
we we first of all we we have to know what is there already um about the evidence of the intervention we have chosen remember we had to choose the intervention so let's say we are working on medication review or um yeah medication review is, is a good example for let's say for a population um which is uh, super poly medicated let's say on 10 or more medicines okay i'll give you this example um so you will build the dossier with all this evidence and then you would plan and conduct your trial you would then perform your if it's a, a, a an economic evaluation based on a trial because it can be also model based um but i'm i'm focusing on the most frequent that we find in the literature which is a trial based and and i suspect that most health payers will require all, a trial even if if you do modeling afterwards but they will require a trial um so you then plan and conduct your economic evaluation. And there are some specificities that are different uh, from the uh, world of, of medicine. Um, so for instance, in the trial, um, as I mentioned before, you have to define your population intervention compared to outcomes. Um, but it's very important that you choose an appropriate study design for deriving effectiveness, because this is your, it's not an efficacy trial. So it's, it's not a, a, a pure randomized control trial in the ideal world that um, you here you want to be able to uh, run an effectiveness trial. So if possible, um, when you do the trial, pharmacists would have to be paid exactly as if they would be paid in you know in after uh, the intervention is reimbursed because that has to mimic the real world <clears throat> uh, and and how successful the intervention would be under real world conditions so mm, that is why it's so important um that we assume it's an effectiveness and not an efficacy trial <clears throat> and then uh, epoch study design also um, helps us to assist on the best possible study design that we can use and that are accepted by Cochrane uh, to run this. Um, then you would need to plan your economic evaluation. So uh, in economic evaluation of medicines, you would use the tiers. So, um, so these are the reporting standards for um, health economic evaluation. Um, and, and the tiers checklist is the widely accepted nowadays, but because you're performing an economic evaluation in pharmacy practice, you have to add certain things that are truly specific um, and that I will detail um, in, in, in shortly. Um, the fourth step you would not find in, in economic evaluation of medicines is the use of a wider spectrum of research methods. It's important to understand here, for instance, patient, things like patient satisfaction, patient experience, <clears throat> behavioral um, process indicators so um, that, that do impact the behavioral change of both patients and providers, and even other variables that are impacting, like if there is no remuneration, that will surely impact or might impact the outcomes as well because it's it's not considered as you would have a normal service but you know just a research um service uh, as such so in the first step i'm going back so performing a systematic review um you, you would like to gather the evidence on two things on the effectiveness of your intervention, but also on the economic evaluation. So what is already available out there uh, about your medication review intervention, let's say, um, and then you would perform the, the review, preferably a systematic review. So you would register the protocol and you would use the reporting guidelines that are accepted like PRISMA, now there is a new version of PRISMA, PRISMA 2020. There is a workshop going on on, on that one, I've seen. 
So um, these are the things we would do. And it's very important for us pharmacists to register the protocol of our systematic review. When I did my overview of systematic reviews, I noticed that um, many reviews of pharmacy-based service did not register the protocol so before performing the, the, the review. And this is something uh, that was actually identified by a lot of non-pharmacist authors. So it's something that we need to improve. Um, then the planning and conduct of trials, as, as I, other than the, 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 the study design, because you're dealing with public health intervention, and if you're doing a long sided trial, you, you would have to look at both the recommendations uh, from Cochrane on the economic evaluation of public health intervention, not, not of Cochrane, sorry, of York, University of York, um, and the recommendations uh, of E4 on the economic evaluation alongside trial. Now, um, so it's important that uh, you, you pay attention to the study designs, uh, the epoch study designs, the perspectives, the societal, uh, we, we may use the NHS or the public sector, but it's important to use the societal, and this is a difference from the economic evaluation of medicine. Time horizon, um, we need to have a trial data able to capture at least the intermediate outcomes. You will not be able to perform a trial to capture things like mortality, uh, which is the end outcome, but it's important to to have a reliable link between the intermediate and the long-term outcome. Uh, for instance, we have this in, in cardiovascular disease with SCORE. SCORE actually has, is, has a predictor uh, in, in 10 years for the values of blood pressure, smoking, uh, cholesterol, and so on. Um, so we, can, we don't need to run trials for 10 years we can run for less than that because we have that, you know, that algorithm, which is core. Um, and there are other diseases that do have that as well. When you um, look at the recommendations alongside trial, um, you should also, as I mentioned, pragmatic trial with less strict protocols. This means this is not efficacy trial, this is effectiveness trial because those are the most relevant for economic evaluation. Uh, your subjects and sites have to be um, closest to the real world target population. See the difference between this and the efficacy trials that we see in the literature? So for economic evaluations, we have to have effectiveness trials. <clears throat> then the sample size uh, calculation, this is easy for epidemiology because you, you really have to look at your most important clinical outcome and, and the sample size has to be based on that. Uh, the estimates beyond trial, um, you, could, um, you could try to, um, to project uh, what would be the estimate of your effectiveness uh, for, let's say, for, for one year or two years. Um, with using techniques such as survival analysis or other techniques. Um, and then, of course, the outcomes. The, the, we, we usually prefer single measures and not a composite of measures. Now, it's important to register your trial. If, if you have a trial, try to register before it starts or at the early onset before recruitment of the patient starts, because this helps increase the robustness of our pharmacy trial. And just uh, uh, try to always report your results in your paper or your chapter of the thesis or whatever you're working on, always using guidelines for trials. Now, it can be either the consort if you're running a randomized controlled trial, or if it's not a randomized controlled trial, you can look at trends, for instance. Then the third step would be the economic evaluation. Again, as I mentioned before, um, in the economic evaluation of services, we have a whole variety of techniques that we can use, like 
cost benefit and cost consequence we haven't spoken or preferred, but nowadays more and more cost utility and cost effectiveness are also recommended if health is the sole benefit. So if there's any chance that your intervention has an impact other than beyond health, then it's important to also perform a cost benefit, as I mentioned. Um, so need to capture these costs and benefits falling in on non-health sectors. That's the reason why we use also cost benefits. Discounting rates, equity. This is something missing from our pharmacy practice research studies. We assess effectiveness, but we seldom look at the impact between different health economic groups. Let's say, um, I want to, uh, my intervention should also be able to assess if, if it shows an improvement in low deprived income people. So uh, you would want to um, run a subgroup analysis looking at the poorest uh, or most deprived people, people with uh, low economic or low education or unemployed, which means you need to collect this data. So, um, so this data, socioeconomic data, needs to be collected if, uh, to be able to measure um, equity uh, and impact on equity because it's desirable that pharmacy interventions also impact um, and have a positive impact on the lowest um, uh, income population. So the ones that most require um, and that could benefit most from, from our services. And this is seldom done. And I think we need to improve this as well. Then the wider spectrum of research methods, as I, I said before, I don't have time to go here uh, into detail. Um, I want to, to, to focus on the data collection, um, uh, especially on the valuation of costs. Um, it's a bit different also from the economic evaluation of medicines. We tend to use a lot of microcosting, um, and I'll show you um, what this means. Then we also need to, um, to do, other than the economic evaluation, there is the statistical method for the economic evaluation. So, for instance, I mentioned before that we use the area under the curve for polys. Um, for effectiveness, you are well aware, it depends on your outcome, but we could use things like uh, difference in difference into GLM or regression analysis or other methods or even odds ratio, um, depending on, on what your, the type of outcome you're working with. But for instance, in terms of cost, we would perform arithmetic mean cost differences, bootstrapping. Uh, this is uh, very important and always working on with confidence intervals um, to, to assess the, the, the uncertainty. Sometimes we have missing values. And when we have missing, it's also important to perform multiple imputation so that we are able to then um, compare costs um, at baseline, because otherwise we, we cannot compare if, if, we, if we don't correct for, for the missing value. Um, and then the reporting, of course. So um, on top of this, this is a lot for the cost effectiveness and the cost benefit. But if you're performing a cost benefit, you would also, other than cheer guidelines from e you would also want to have a look at the three major ESPOR guidelines on conjoint analysis, experimental designs, and statistical methods for discrete choice experiments. So these are the three major uh, guidance uh, you would find for, um, for discrete choice, and, and, um, which is not the same as cost benefit. Okay? When discrete choice, when, when you incorporate price, then you are able to estimate willingness to pay. And only then, when one of your attributes is cost, um, then you, you, can, you can compare the willingness to pay versus the cost incurred, and then you are performing a cost-benefit analysis. Okay, 
So the wider spectrum, I've already, uh, it, it uses usually mixed methods. And this is very important for pharmacy practice research. We, we tend to underestimate the value of this research, but actually it's so important to, to be able to, to perform qualitative studies, uh, capturing patient satisfaction, patient experience, um, and things like fidelity of intervention, like um, uh, what, how far did the intervention provided match with the one that we designed, okay? And, and then things like sustainability, context, and applicability. I, I don't have time to go into details, but there is a lot of literature on how to measure this. And this is important to understand why um, interventions succeed or fail. This is the most important piece of uh, uh, research uh, that we have to understand that. So um, now, moving to the last bit of my uh, talk, and I'm here with my chronometer <laughs> to make sure I keep in with the deadline before Charlotte rings the bell. <laughs> but um, I would like to use the last uh, minutes of this um, of this webinar uh, to, um, to have a more interactive uh, session now with you. So um, what I want to share here and what I want to hear from you is after you've heard, and, and some of you probably are quite familiar already with this and, and probably even more experts, um, and some of you might not be, uh, so please forgive because I, I do not know exactly um, how you can, but I hope um, the, the, the way I try to, you know, uh, to, to kind of give the foundations and then um, moving on to the health economic approaches used uh, in pharmacy practice research. And now what I wanted to, to hear from you, is I, I will show you some examples, some papers, um, and, and I, I'm going to ask you a few questions. It, 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 it's for just for the purpose of, you know, uh, having a, a discussion. Um, okay, so in this slide, I copied this from a, 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 a very, I have the references in, in the, the next slide. So I, I've joined a couple references for you, for those of you who want to look further in this area. But right now, what I wanted to, have you look at the, the bit of information. So it says that the following data were requested from patients at three points. Um, and we have things um, like adherence, quality of life, um, patient uh, knowledge, skills, and confidence using the, all of these uses certain instruments uh, between brackets. And then, of course, then we have also the natural, um, let's say, um, uh, measures, um, outcome measures. So when you look at this, what do you think we could do? Which techniques of, of um, economic evaluations we could do just by looking at the kind of data they, they collected? Anyone wants to share their thoughts? Please just open your mic and put on your camera and answer Suzette's question. Don't be shy. I think with this information, we could do either cost effectiveness because we we uh, measure in the adherence, and we could also do the cost utility because we've got the the quality also, and mm -hmm. that's it. Great, good, great. So we could, as you very well pointed, um, Noelia, right? Um, so you, you could do a cost effectiveness analysis because you're collecting adherence, but also because you're collecting blood pressure, um, lipid profile, and, uh, and so these are the natural outcomes. So you could do uh, using different outcomes, 
true, correct. And you could also do a cost utility because you're collecting, um, you're asking patients to uh, answer the EQ5L, in this case it's the 5L, so this is the instrument for quality of life, uh, which they would fill at uh, baseline six and 12 months. So yes, you, you could actually perform this if, if you collect the cost. Very, very good. Um, My question is, when you've got like different outcomes, like blood, blood pressure, you've got the adherence, you've got all of them, which one do you choose to do the, the cost effect, effectiveness? Yeah, it's a very good question, very relevant question. Normally, it's not recommended to use a composite um, outcome. So you would, and that's the thing with the, the cost effectiveness. So you would do cost effectiveness for your most relevant uh, natural outcome. So here I would say, depending on the data that you have, like uh, if you have blood pressure and lipid profiles, you, would, you could do cost effectiveness for blood pressure and for lipid profile, and you could also do for adherence because it's an intermediate, but it's a, an important, um, I would say, uh, proxy outcome uh, along with blood pressure and lipid pro profile. So I, I would choose this three, but it could be, you know, it, it depends on, on, the, on the population, uh, which is not stated here, but it would have to be different cost effectiveness. And, and that's the thing with the cost effectiveness. That was a very good question. Thank you. And um, so, okay, so here, um, what we see is I, I want to show you, I want to share with you how they converted uh, the, the information they used. So you will see you have here the various clinical measures that we've seen before, right? The adherence, the knowledge, the, uh, the EQ, 5, the 5L. Five so what they do is that they collect um, at baseline, then they would do the mid um, collection, the mid uh, point collection, and, and then at the 12 months. So I want you to look at this column, baseline results and the follow-up results. So, and here, the mean difference. So here, basically, what does this tell you, this column? What's the meaning of this column in one word? Pardon? Effectiveness, yeah, correct, effective. This is the effectiveness. So what we find here is this, they are actually measuring um, whether these outcomes, right, they, the, our clinical measures have improved from baseline to follow-up. So you can see that there was a, an improvement here in the Q5 uh, uh, D score. Um, then you can see that there was an improvement in the adherence score as well. Um, then you can see that there was an there are some substantial improvements, systolic blood pressure. Um, so th there is this mean difference um, that was uh, that was obtained. So in here, what this chart uh, shows us is exactly the effectiveness uh, that they have. Um, when collecting all the data from all the patients, and most of you uh, who have done effectiveness studies are familiar with this. Uh, so this part is not really new other than probably uh, working with a new um, outcome, which is the Q5D um, 5L, okay? So now here, what do we have on your left side? We talked about outcomes and consequences. What about here? What is this? Somebody, please. 
the, the, the costs, how to measure the costs. Mm -hmm. So um, here is mm, before the cost is the, the resources, the consumption of resources. Collect is things like uh, how many times uh, during that period, um, what was the number of consultations uh, both at the doctor and at the pharmacy, for instance, um, and what was the time spent uh, in, in the consultation? So, so you can estimate actually the cost per minute, uh, which is the most relevant cost in pharmacy, um, in pharmacy research and economic evaluation. So it's very important to collect um, the, the time the, the volume of, of, of uh, visits to the pharmacy and to the doctor and to the hospital and whatever, and, and the time spent, especially at the pharmacy and at the doctor, because then you can assign unit costs, and I'll, I'll talk about that. But first, you have to collect the volume um, of, uh, of, of the, so the consumption of resources, as we call it. And these are this kind of things, but also days in hospital, you would ask the patients very often to report on um, in the last, like in, in the last um, six months, uh, how many times are, were you at the hospital? Um, did you stay at the hospital? So you would collect information on the days, the GP visits, the nurse, the hospital doctor, and, and a lot of other things could be other things in here. But this is the consumption of resources. And on the right hand side, what do you think it is? Very, very intuitive, but um, what, what do you, what is this that I spoke before? Well, it's, it's an overview of the, the cost per. GP visits per day in hospital. Yeah. Okay, so this is the unit cost. Remember yeah. I said the first step was to identify the category, so the, 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 the cost the, and then the consumption. So you have to have the quantity first, and then you have to have the unit cost. So what, what is the cost for Can pharmacy? Can I just say one thing? Yes. We have to be back in five minutes. Okay, so I'm finishing. Up. Yep, we'll I'm finishing. The main room. Right, so um, thank you, Charlotte. It's nearly over. So these are the unit costs. So you would multiply the unit cost times the quantity that you had. Now here, I just want to say that it's very important that under pharmacist costs that you talk to you collect this information from your pharmacy association, so it best reflects what is the average um, cost, considering also a margin. So, so it's not just the cost; it's actually the price of your a fee for your intervention. This is very important um, because you don't want to be reimbursed just to pay the cost. You want to be able to have a fair margin. So. Just to wrap up, these would be the charts uh, summarizing the quantity and the cost on total and the mean difference uh, that you would encounter. And this would be like the, 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 the cost effectiveness plane again um, and uh, the acceptability curve. So I leave you with uh, all these references that are very useful for someone who wants to go deep into the types of, uh, of analysis of, of things around economic evaluation. Um, and to wrap up, we need to build the value dossier. That's my message, take home message. And we also need to think that the future models of payment of reimbursing these services will not be fee for service, but more and more we will move into bundle payments and capitation payments and, and all that stuff. So that was it. Thank you. I uh, hope this was useful and um, feel free to uh, yeah drop an email, whatever I can do to help you in your project. I'll be happy.
And thank you, Charlotte. You're very welcome, she said, and thank you very much for a very great overview. I know you're also part of the Facebook group, so if you don't find Suzette anywhere else, you can you can reach out to her there. It was great. Uh, it's always very difficult, but I think you gave a very good overview of a very complex area. So thank you very very much. It's it's crucial. This area is crucial for for everything we do because if. Uh, the payers want to see the, the economics of it. So if it doesn't work, we, we are lost in this. So thank you very much, Suzette, um, for networking or for reaching out to colleagues uh, about uh, health economics. Please reach out to, uh, in the online network uh, group because then you can, uh, you can find colleagues that work in the same area. And then we will be dragged into the main lecture for the closing uh, in just a few minutes time. Thank you very much for attending.